My name is Christine Guillaume, I'm the president of the Harvard Crimson. Um, just want to say a few words about our keynote speaker tonight. Um, what I do want to start with is, you know, earlier when we were doing that exercise going around the room and everyone talking about the stories that, you know, had an impact on them, that inspired them, was such a, I think, amazing and remarkable moment. So thank you to Anne-Marie for having us do that. And I think a common thread in the stories that we were all hearing about are these stories about talking about underrepresented communities, talking about people facing an adversity, and talking about one of the key tenets of our mission as journalists of holding people accountable. And I think that's what Marissa Kwiatkowski has really done in her reporting. Um, so a little background on her. She is currently an, an investigative reporter at USA Today, which she recently joined after a successful and extremely remarkable career at the Indianapolis Star. In 2016, as we uh, talked about earlier, Marissa and her colleagues at the Star launched an investigation into USA Gymnastics that revealed how top officials at the national governing body had uh, failed to report many, many allegations of sexual uh, misconduct and assault. The series had real and immediate impacts, and I think that's something we all strive for as journalists, is it prompted 500 women to come forward with allegations against Larry Nassar. Um, for her work, Marissa has earned more than 50 journalism awards not only for the aforementioned coverage, but also for work covering mental illness uh, in children with developmental disabilities. Um, I personally think it's so incredible that it's so obvious that her reporting has had such serious and monumental impacts on not only the communities that she's reported on, but also around the country. It's had incredible ripple effects. And so I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce her, and I'm so excited to hear from her today. Thank you. Oh, and yes, there will be time for questions after. Yeah, so prepare all of your really hard questions. I'm ready. Good evening. Thank you to the Neiman Foundation for bringing me back. I'm so happy to be back in Boston. And it's a particular honor to be here with you guys tonight because you are all the future of our profession, and based on what I've heard so far, I'm very, very excited to see what you guys do next. For as long as I can remember, I've been passionate about journalism. Never wanted to do anything else. When I was six, I asked my parents for a typewriter for Christmas. It was very cool, it was black and red. I had my first professional internship at 15 and my first full-time journalism job before I graduated from college, and uh, 15 years later, give or take, uh, I'm incredibly fortunate to still be spending my life doing what I love. And while every investigation that I've done has shaped the journalist that I am today, I'm here to talk to you tonight about one of the more recent projects that has shaped me and the past three years of my life. In March of 2016, I was investigating systemic excuse me, systemic failures to report sexual abuse in schools. There had been a number of local cases in Indiana in which a school official was having a sexual relationship with an underage student. Other officials at the school found out about it, but didn't immediately report it to authorities as required by Indiana law. And so while I was investigating, why does this seem to keep happening? Why is it so hard for these officials to immediately report these allegations to authorities as required by law? I had a source reach out and say, I really think you should look at USA Gymnastics and how they handle sexual abuse allegations. And that source pointed me toward a lawsuit in Georgia that he said would show how they handled those allegations and the impact of that allegation. So as journalists do, I did due diligence, right? I uh, called attorneys connected to the case and found out a little bit more about the case itself. It was involving a predatory coach, and it was a lawsuit that was filed both against USA Gymnastics and the coach, alleging that USA Gymnastics had known about the coach's behavior for years, but not reported it to law enforcement. And so step two, right, is to get access to the documents. And so I asked the attorneys to provide them. They weren't willing to do so. The records weren't available online. They wouldn't take a credit card over the phone. Uh, they wanted a 
business check mailed to them, but there was a time trigger because I was told that the judge might soon be sealing records in the case. So I needed to, if I was going to access those documents, get them quickly. So my bosses at the time, Steve Berta, Alvi Lindsay, and Jeff Taylor discussed it and agreed that I should go to Georgia. So the same day I got the tip, I was on a plane. I was heading to Effingham County. I heard there were some Atlanta people in here, so you may have heard of Effingham County. It's about 40 minutes outside of Savannah, but I flew into Atlanta because it was cheaper. And uh, so I made the four hour trek from Atlanta to Effingham County and arrived at the courthouse as it opened the next day. And I asked, basically I walked in and I said, I'd like copies of the entire court file for this case. Then I waited. It's a small court, uh, not a lot of people. So uh, I waited for a few hours lurking non-creepily in the, <laughs> maybe creepily, in the uh, clerk's area waiting for the documents. They handed me a box of about 400 records. So I went out to my rental car, and this is really important. I dug through the records that I'd been given. I spent a lot of time and money, okay, the company's time and money to get there, and I wanted to make sure that I left with what I needed. So I started flipping through all of the files, and then I called one of the plaintiff's attorneys, and I said, do I have everything? He said, do you have this? No. Do you have this? No. He kept naming documents. They were not in the box of documents that I had. So he said, no, you don't have everything. So I went back into the courthouse, and I told the clerk I thought I was missing records, and could they check to see if there were other documents that were available. The clerk told me they'd copied everything in the file, but she said maybe there are records in the judge's chamber. He was at lunch, so I had to wait. Now, mind you, I had a plane to catch that very same day, and I needed to, I had timed it out perfectly, I needed to leave the courthouse by 2.30 p.m. in order to catch my flight. So I left the clerk my phone number, I grabbed lunch nearby, again, I did some lurking, this time in the parking lot, uh, called them several times checking on whether the documents were available, and at, no kidding, 2.25 p.m., they told me they'd copied about 500 more records, and I walked in, and literally all of the documents that I needed were in that second wave of files. So in all, I left with almost 1,000 pages of records that first day, started reading them on the plane. The very next morning, I had editors crowded around my desk asking me what I had. Now, I want to take a minute and point out that what made this investigation somewhat unusual for other investigations that I've done throughout my career is that we could immediately prove what was wrong. So we knew through depositions of current and former USA Gymnastics officials that the organization had an executive policy of not reporting all sexual abuse allegations to authorities. That unless the complaint was signed by a victim or a victim's parent or an eyewitness to the abuse, that it was just taken and put into a file, in a file drawer and tucked away. And so the next step in our investigation was to find out about the impact of that policy on the safety of children in the sport. We knew what they were doing, now we had to find out what it meant. It was a big undertaking. So two colleagues, Tim Evans and Mark Alicia, quickly joined the investigation. And the three of us spent the next four and a half months backgrounding more than 100 coaches. We started with USA Gymnastics' own published list of individuals who were banned from the sport. And then we started requesting records from all over the country, interviewing survivors, and gathering as much information as we could. There were a lot of late nights, early mornings, weekends, as we tried to put everything together. Meanwhile, the Indianapolis Star had filed a motion to intervene in that original Georgia lawsuit that I mentioned. Some of the records had, in fact, already been sealed by the judge, and the attorney on behalf of Gannett and the Indianapolis Star argued that those records should be public. They were a, a number of records, including full depositions of some officials, as well as the actual sexual misconduct complaint files on 52 coaches that USA, I believe it was 54, that USA Gymnastics had compiled on coaches and other officials connected to the organization. And so that motion, when it was filed in June of 2016, 
was added pressure for our investigation because what it meant for those of you who have ever had occasion to request a court document is it's generally public record. And so we knew that as soon as we had filed that motion, which pretty much laid out the findings of our investigation, that anyone at any time could pick up that motion to intervene and basically write our investigation before we could just citing the paper. So we had a draft ready to go and we made sure that it was continually updated as we continued reporting and pursuing the information that we needed. Meanwhile, USA Gymnastics filed its response to the Indianapolis Star's motion to intervene. And in it, the organization said that IndyStar gave, and I have to read it because I don't want to get it wrong, uh, IndyStar gave no explanation for how the disclosure of sealed records would, quote, serve any other function than to allow IndyStar to publish a national inquirer-like article based on events 10 to 20 years ago in order to satisfy the economic interests of IndyStar's advertisers, owners, and investors, end quote. And during court proceedings, USA Gymnastics also argued that the Indianapolis Star and its reporters were attempting to invade people's privacy and also on a, quote, witch hunt, end quote. We tried repeatedly during this period to interview USA Gymnastics both before and after that motion to intervene, but they declined our requests and with only one exception required all questions be submitted in writing. One of the most important questions that we needed answers to, or an answer to it as we were pursuing this, was whether USA Gymnastics had changed the way it handled sexual abuse allegations since the depositions had been taken. Were they still putting those documents in a file drawer or were they now reporting them to authorities? And it took a bit of time, but ultimately the attorney for the organization confirmed that the policy had not changed since at least the 1990s. And that was the confirmation that we needed to know that USA Gymnastics was still using that same policy as it related to the welfare of children. We also, in that same time period, found multiple examples of situations in which USA Gymnastics had learned of allegations of sexual abuse, not reported them, and then other children were abused. So, Finally, through all of that, we're nearing publication. And after lots of editing, and when I say lots of editing, I mean a lot of editing, we had 13 editors on the first piece in our investigation. Yes, the editor in the room is cringing. <laughs> and um, because it was running both in the Indianapolis Star, USA Today, and papers all over the country that are owned by Gannett, and so there was an extra level of scrutiny. Um, after th all of that, we started our final fact check. We fact checked every word of every sentence of every paragraph in the entire piece. We used a agreed upon Merriam-Webster dictionary to look up the meaning of what you guys would probably consider pretty basic words to ensure that we could back up every assertion that we were making. That first article published August 4th of 2016, the day before the start of the Olympic Games in Rio. We did not plan it that way. Uh, it was the first day that we, our bosses, and the editors up the chain felt that it was ready to go. I will also say, uh, for those of you who are interested in pursuing investigations, you should know uh, none of us slept well the night before, which is true of every investigation I've ever done. Uh, I don't think we breathed easy until USA Gymnastics issued its statement in response to our investigation. You can read the entire thing on the Indianapolis Star's website. We posted it in its entirety. But essentially, it said the organization felt we left out what it considered significant facts that would have painted a more accurate picture of the organization's efforts to protect children. Today, of course, we realized there was still a lot that we did not yet know. But at the time, we looked at that statement with relief as journalists because it told us that what we'd reported was accurate. They just weren't happy with it. At the same time, the day that first article came out, we received voicemails, emails, and messages from people who were asking us to look into other predatory coaches and other gymnastics officials who they believe were child predators involved in the organization. One of those emails came from a woman named Rachel Den Hollander. And she told us that she too had been abused, but not by a coach, by a doctor. 
That doctor's name was Larry Nassar. It was a name we'd heard before during the course of backgrounding individuals associated with the organization, but that was the first time that we'd received allegations of sexual abuse against him. And it wouldn't be the last time. Within a couple weeks, we heard from two others who said Nasser had abused them as well. The three of us at that point, when we had multiple survivors who were from different levels of gymnastics, different states, had no connection to one another, we started pursuing that story, again, still working on other gymnastics-related pieces at the same time. Mark and photographer Robert Shear drove to Louisville to interview Rachel. I flew to California to interview another survivor who was a Jane Doe at the time. And Tim drove to Michigan to interview Nasser. Our investigation into Nasser, I think it's worth pointing out, was different from any of the investigations we'd done into individuals up to that point. And what was different is everyone we'd written about up to that point as it related to USA Gymnastics was someone who had been charged or convicted of a crime. Larry Nasser had not been at this time. He was still practicing medicine. He was a professor at Michigan State University. He was running for school board and he was also affiliated with at least one nonprofit. And so he was someone who was very well regarded in the community that he lived in. And that added a level of complexity to our reporting process, not his accolades, but the fact that he had not yet been charged or convicted with any crime. There were no documents to talk about the allegations. So we not only had to background Nasser, but we also had to look into the backgrounds of all of the survivors. Something as simple as if they told us that they were abused at a particular competition in a particular country a particular year, we looked to see whether there was a competition in that country that year, whether the gymnast was at that competition, whether Nasser was at that competition, and just trying to verify as many details as we could to make sure that we were getting the story right. We also looked at medical records. We looked at, um, we had some information from lawsuits. We had other information as well. And I think it's important to point out, um, we also researched medical treatments because one of the things that we wanted to find out was, is what Nasser was doing to these survivors a legitimate medical treatment? And if that kind of treatment existed, was he using best practices to do that treatment? Was he doing the things he should have been doing? Our research indicated that he had not. So after gathering records, verifying all of the information that we could, we published our first article about Larry Nasser on September 12th of 2016. There were two immediate competing reactions from the public. On one hand, there was pretty significant pushback from members of the community, his supporters who told us that we were wrong, that there was no way it was true, that we were trashing a good man's reputation, and they were very upset with our first article. But at the same time, we heard from more women who said that they too were survivors. And forgive me for being graphic uh, right after we've had dinner, but there was one very specific thing that Nasser's attorney did that changed the trajectory of Nasser's case. That attorney told us on the record that Nasser had never used penetration in the course of a medical treatment. There were many, many women who knew that that was false because he had done that to him. And a number of them had not realized up until that point that what he'd done to them was abuse. And the number of survivors continued to grow. And I, I'm sure a lot of you know what happens next. So the first thing that happened was Nasser's arrest, right? Um, he was initially arrested on possession of child pornography, and that was significant from the supporters' perspective because that was the point that the critics of our reporting kind of went away when he faced those federal charges. Um, there were also charges over criminal sexual conduct involving um, a young woman who was not one of his patients, but was a neighbor, as well as later some other individuals who were patients. And over the next few months, we learned a lot more about what USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University had done or not done as it related to Larry Nasser. 
We learned that MSU had received allegations about Nasser years earlier, that there had been a Title IX investigation, that there had been also reports to police in other jurisdictions prior to. We also learned that USA Gymnastics had waited five weeks to report its allegations that it had received against Nasser, and in that five-week period conducted its own investigation. In that same time period, as they were doing their own investigation, they also agreed to provide excuses for Nasser's absences from events. And Nasser had asked at one point, can we just say I'm sick? Moving forward over the next, I guess, two years, it's been since that time, um, there have been a lot of significant things happening in the case. So Nasser, as uh, many of you may know, pleaded guilty, and he was sentenced during what was a very um, public sentencing hearing. The judge allowed survivors, including those who weren't specified as victims in the criminal case to testify and share their experiences. It was recorded, there were cameras in the courtroom, and it was very powerful for people, I think, to fully understand the scope of what he'd done and the time period over which he had done it. Uh, there were 160, excuse me, 156 survivors that shared their stories during that first hearing. And that was the point that a lot of them came forward with their names. Up to that point, many, many of them had been Jane Doe's. Today, as several people have mentioned tonight, about 500 people have come forward with allegations against him. Um, he will likely spend the rest of his life in prison. He got a 60-year federal prison sentence on the child pornography case, and then he was sentenced to up to 175 years in one of the criminal sexual conduct cases, and I think up to 125 in the other put that together, that's basically life, right? Um, he is there because Rachel, Jamie, Jessica, and so many others trusted us, trusted police, and trusted prosecutors <clears throat> with their stories. There have been other changes as well. There's a new federal law that requires national governing bodies, such as USA Gymnastics, to immediately report sexual abuse allegations to authorities. The then president of USA Gymnastics, Steve Penny, resigned and was later criminally charged and accused of tampering with evidence. Others, including former Michigan State University President Luanna Simon, former gymnastics co coach Kathy Klages, also faced charges. USA Gymnastics has also struggled as an organization. They've had a number of different president and CEOs since that time. Uh, including a new one who uh, just recently came on board. There were reports that were commissioned both in and outside of USA Gymnastics that confirmed the findings of our investigation. There was a $500 million settlement by Michigan State University to survivors of Nasser's abuse. Uh, USA Gymnastics had almost complete turnover. They had board resignations. They had many other people either forced to resign or fired from the organization. The organization filed for bankruptcy. I know it's getting long, right? Uh, the US Olympic Committee also threatened to decertify USA Gymnastics as the sport's national governing body. There are also multiple criminal and congressional investigations that are still underway. My colleagues and I hope that the work we've done will fundamentally improve the safety of children in the sport and in other sports there's still a lot of work to be done. If I can tell you anything as you are embarking on your own careers and as you're pursuing your own work, I would tell you, take care of yourselves. This is hard work, emotional work, sometimes very dark work. So know when you need a break, figure out whatever that thing is, whether it's exercise or music or gardening or reality TV or whatever it is, find that thing that takes you out of the moment, out of the work that will help you move forward and not burn out. And lean on your colleagues. Journalism, as many of you have probably already figured out from your collegiate work, a team effort, especially when it comes to investigations. There are the bosses who are providing the time and resources, the editors who are providing invaluable guidance, 
the reporters collaborating on projects, the visual and data journalists who help bring stories to life, and the digital and social media teams and others who put everything together. For all of us, being a journalist is both a privilege and a responsibility. We are privileged to see a world beyond the one in which we grew up. We are privileged to have people open their homes, their thoughts, their lives to us, to trust us, to share with us some of the happiest and in some cases some of the darkest moments that they will ever experience. That privilege is also a responsibility because for many people we are their only chance of helping others understand what they've been through or how something has affected them. We are their voice in the community. As journalists, we spend those days, nights, weekends, digging into these situations because we wanna make a difference. And I hope the same is true for all of you. As you begin your careers, I hope you ask the hard questions. I hope you look for the stories that no one else is telling. And I hope you give a voice to those who aren't heard. Thank you. Now the hard part. Who has questions? Yeah. Sorry. Hi, my name is Alvin Bynes. I'm a reporter for the Beat. I just wanted to know how long and what is the process in for you as a reporter in gaining the trust of um, survivors of sexual assault? Um, can you kind of walk me through the how, how you get in touch with them in the first place? Yes. Um, so. We started, there's sort of a different process depending on how you're approaching someone. So if it's someone that you're approaching that they haven't come to you, it's sort of a different frame of reference. When we're trying to connect with a survivor that we want to interview, whenever possible, we've tried to use an intermediary. Someone, and this is really important, that we know knows about the abuse and might be willing to reach out to them and ask them if they'd be willing to speak with us. And I think that's really important because what you don't want to do is call someone at work, right, and say, hey, so I heard you're a survivor of sexual abuse. I was hoping you might be able to speak with me. We don't want to do that. And so an intermediary, and when I say that, I mean it could be a parent that you know for sure was aware of the abuse. It could be a victim's advocate in a court. It could be a deputy prosecutor. It could be a police detective. But someone that you know was aware of what had happened and might be willing to bridge that communication. And so once that communication, that initial communication is made, for me, and I could, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. If you have other questions more specifically, I'm happy to talk through it. But the, the most important thing is to over communicate about why you want to talk to them. Why do you want them to relive a difficult moment, perhaps the most difficult moment of their lives. And so we were very open with people about this is why we think your story is important and why we want to share it with the public. And we also gave them an opportunity to ask us questions. So before I ask a single question of a survivor, I ask, do you have any questions for me? Is there anything that you're concerned about? And what that does is sometimes it can help you connect with blind spots that you don't know exist. So as an example, I was doing a, a story about a sexual assault case that was a cold case. And I had asked her that question, is there anything that you want to talk about, anything you're concerned about? And what she said to me was, I'm comfortable with you writing anything about my case except about my hair, because that's a trigger for me. It reminds me of what happened. I will tell you anything you want to know, but if you just won't write about my hair in the story, that would make me feel better. And so I understood up front that there were certain things that would affect her, and I was able to navigate through that in the interview. The other thing I think that it's really important to say up front, particularly for survivors, and this could be someone who's lost a loved one as well, but I think particularly for survivors of violence is telling them that you're asking detailed questions for a reason. Because a lot of these people may have tried to tell somebody before and they weren't believed or they were dismissed. And so helping them understand that you're asking those questions because you're trying to get at the truth, you're trying to understand what happened, not because you're questioning them or you don't believe them. Those are kind of the things that I would do starting out before I even ask a single question, is laying that foundation for why they should trust you and feel comfortable in sharing their stories with you. Other questions? Yeah. 
What issues, if any, did you face when dealing with Michigan State, and how did you kind of work through the complexities of their records and them speaking to you regarding the case? My disclaimer to what I'm about to say is that most of the amazing Michigan State University coverage that was done was done actually by our colleagues at the Lansing State Journal, Matt Mencrini in particular. And so we were focused primarily on the national scope and, and USA Gymnastics. When we did deal with Michigan State University early on, they were actually pretty open with us. Um, they answered questions. They did provide us with records. Um, I will say later, and we were talking about this, and I can't remember the exact number, but I do remember putting in a request and we got the bill back and they were trying to ask us to pay $250,000 or something crazy like that. Um, ultimately, we ended up getting the records without paying all of that money, but those were really kind of the only challenges specifically with Michigan State University. I think what you saw happen, which would be better for somebody like Matt to talk about versus me, is that the more that information came out and the more about the university's role in the allegations came out, the more tight-lipped they became. But when we were dealing with them, they were a lot more forthcoming. Yeah. Kind of piggyback off that, obviously we're all student journalists here, or uh, some of us were. How do you, what, is, what is your advice on student to us when our own institution will be kind of closeted? You know, God forbid scandals don't happen to our institutions, but there are, there's that chance that some day that will happen. So what is your advice to us on handling when it's our college? Well, I think first, you know, again, remember why you're doing it. And so um, to the first question that was asked, making sure that you're treating people with respect and that you're not making somebody who's been through trauma worse, right? That you're not hurting somebody who's already been hurt. Um, I also think it's important from any journalism perspective, whether it's student media or not, to make sure that you're verifying information. It can be easy to, if there's a wave of information coming at you, not take those same meticulous steps to confirm it. And that can be really dangerous. So making sure that you have a standard, whatever your standard is, like for us as an example, the standard that we had set as it related to Nasser was that when it got down to publication time, either they had to use their full name there had to be a lawsuit that had been filed or there had to be a police report that had been filed. So we had some sort of documentation to back it up or we had that lack, I guess, of anonymity. And not to in any way pressure anyone, but we interviewed people extensively that we never quoted because they didn't meet that standard for publication. That didn't mean we didn't believe them. It just meant that that was the standard we'd set. So for any student publication, deciding what your standard is and you know, figuring it out together and making sure that no matter what happens, you're sticking to it. Um, and we were having a very lively and fun discussion, and maybe I'm just nerdy, about FOIA at this table during dinner. And so I would also say that, you know, sometimes use their own responses against them. We were talking about um, how they cite certain things to deny it, or they're using certain things to force you to do something. Figure out creative ways to navigate through that. Um, would be kind of the, I guess, blanket advice. And if, if any of you get to the point too, I'm super easy to find. If any of you need to talk through something at some point, bug me, I'm happy to talk through more specifics too. But those are kind of general guidelines and the most important of which being set a standard and commit to that standard no matter what. Other questions? Yeah. I want to know how did you also approach to the person who was accused? Um, just like because you want to make sure like um, his voice is also included mm -hmm. um, in the article so how did you like approach to um, the person who's accused and also like during the investigation process um, how did you make sure no information is maybe like being leaked or like having some other parties knowing that you're under like having this kind of process undergoing this kind of investigative process um, before your first articles is published well yeah obviously ethically we have to ask the person who's accused to speak as well and share their perspective and so all of that due diligence that i talked about 
we did before we went to Larry and asked him a single question. So when Tim had reached out to him, and I'll also say that we contacted a lot of people accused or convicted of crimes throughout the investigation, and um, almost all of them declined to be interviewed. Uh, one was the jail staff declined the interview because he wasn't fit to be interviewed. Uh, the only person who actually agreed to the interview was Larry. And uh, as I mentioned, my colleague Tim Evans was the one who had done that interview. And he had sent him an email saying these allegations have been made. He was very upfront about why he wanted to talk to them. You don't want to skirt around it or make it sound like it's something that it's not. So he was very clear that allegations had been made and he wanted to hear Larry's side. Larry wrote back and he said, I'd be happy to talk to you about this. I'm sorry they misunderstood my medical treatment. Why don't you come meet at my house such and such day? <clears throat> about an hour later, he sent another email and he said, my wife doesn't think it's a good idea that you come to the house. Uh, why don't we meet at my attorney's office at such and such time? So um, Tim went there and um, again, laid out the findings that we'd had and, and the specific questions that we were asking. And, and that's why when I say you're asking detailed questions about what the women went through, it's because it helps you to, again, research the medical treatment. So when he's talking about medical treatment, Tim already had all of that research about how things are supposed to work and what the women said had happened to use to pursue the investigation. And in the beginning of the interview, uh, Tim has an amazing column that um, you can read to hear it in his own words. He tells it way better than I do because he was there. Um, but he talks about how Larry showed him YouTube videos of treatment that were uncomfortable, but they did not involve um, penetration. And talked about, you know, this is how I do it. This is how it might be misinterpreted. And it wasn't until actually we were about to go with the story while Tim was there that we called Tim and we said, we have everything that we need to publish. We need a statement from him that the interview at that point stopped and his attorney issued that statement. So it's very important, I guess a shorter way of saying it, very important to get their perspective and listen to them and hear what they have to say in fairness, because we don't know the answer before we ask all the questions, before we do all the research, right? We can't go in with a preconceived notion of what the story is. And um, your second question was about the investigative process and how it works. Make sure no one knows you're doing this kind of investigation on this specific issue. Well, I mean, sure, in a perfect world, right? Nobody knows. There's no competitive pressure whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I think anytime you're working in an investigation, you're relatively tight lipped outside of the team that's involved with it, um, maybe outside of the newsroom, you're not really talking about it. And depending on how sensitive it is, I mean, generally a survivor is probably not going to go and, you know, unprompted and continue to try and share their story elsewhere. But generally we just tell people, look, we're trying to do this right. It's going to take time. And if you at any point have any questions, let us know. We, we hope you'll, you know, give us the time to do this right. Because we don't want to just rush something in to get it out first. We want it to be done the right way. Um, so, uh, you know, I think more important than being first is being right. And I'm sure you guys hear this again and again, right, in your classes, but nobody remembers other than like the journalists that were specifically involved with it. Nobody remembers who was first, but they certainly remember who was wrong. So I always look at it like making sure you're right. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. If you were to go back and do it all over again, is there anything you would do differently? <laughs> I was going to ask this question and, you know, I think that we did the best we could with the information at, that we had at the time. What I would say is I wish I could go back and write that first article knowing what I know now. Uh, that would be a hell of an article, but <laughs> we can't do that, right? It doesn't work that way. So uh, I think that we did the best we could with the information that we had, and I think that that part of the reason that we got where we got and the public got where they got with understanding the information was 
that the more people were talking about it, the more people felt comfortable coming forward. You see that a lot with um, people who are survivors, that one voice leads to another voice. It gives somebody else the strength to come forward. Yeah. I have a question about um, when you were at the courthouse requesting the documents, after yeah. you got um, the, the second batch with the, the more inclusive documents, that's something that happens often uh, in, in investigations where courts aren't always most forthcoming with documents, and is there any sort of accountability, or how do journalists, uh, investigative journalists navigate that? Well, I mean, it depends on the court, okay? So let me just start there. It depends on the court. I mean, in their particular case, to give them um, what I think is fair credit, I don't think they realized that there were more documents because they don't know every, how big every single file in the office is. So I don't think there was anything nefarious going on there. I think they just legitimately didn't know that some of the documents were in the judge's chamber because they weren't on the docket sheet. So there was no way that they would have known if they hadn't asked for it. Um, but I, I would say that, uh, yeah, certainly there have been other courts that are less willing to provide information. Something that was really wonderful about this court that I have not experienced sometimes in other courts is that I did not put in a FOIA request. I just strolled on up and said, hey, can I have a copy of the entire file? What could have happened, like, and has happened to me in other courts is, first they make you fill out even if you submit a FOIA in advance, they make you fill out their specific FOIA form. And then they make you wait up to 10 days, or depending on what state it is, however long it has to be. And then you have to come back, and you have to pick up the records, and you have to pay for the records and all of that. So it could have gone a different way. I could have flown down there, shown up at the courthouse, mm -hmm. and they could have said, oh, that's great. Here, can you fill out this form, and we'll get back to you when we can. So. Uh, I want to give them credit where credit's due because they were very nice in just handing me almost 1,000 pages of records like they had nothing else going on that day. <laughs> By the way, if anybody ever like works in Effingham County, I heard some really interesting story ideas that were local just by lurking in the clerk's office. So pro tip. Sure, yeah, sorry. When I say FOIA, I'm actually using it uh, as a very broad terminology, not the Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Information Act actually is a federal side, so if you're requesting federal records. But I just use it because it's faster to say than like Indiana Access to Public Records Act. But basically what I mean is a public records request. So a request saying, I would like these documents and I am entitled to them under the law. So that's what I mean when I say FOIA, if anyone's like, what in the world is she saying? Um, I'd like to know at what part in the investigation did you realize that this story was bigger than what you initially thought it was? Hmm. I mean, you know, I would say it happened multiple times in the investigation. I mean, I think, you know, we knew, like I said early on, about the policy. But then I think we knew it was getting bigger than that when we found out about Larry Nasser and the allegations against him and the different survivors who had come forward about him. And then I think we knew, again, it was bigger when it came to, um, after the first article about Larry published, all of the other survivors, we had like 16 more survivors come forward in a week, um, just kind of quickly coming in and, and interviewing them. So I think we started to realize how much bigger it was at that point. And, and something that I, I guess I didn't mention as I was quickly going through the timeline, but you know, when you talk about impact, technically the real impact took a long time to happen. So they had proposed the new federal law, but it wasn't signed into law until like 2018. It was proposed in 16 when we did our investigation. Um, Larry was charged in 16, but you know he wasn't sentenced until 2018. Um, a lot of the other changes didn't happen until significantly later. So it was really about us like continuing to report on it that I think we kept realizing that there was more that we didn't know. I still think to this day that there's a lot more that I don't know about what was going on. And will we at some point know everything? I'm really not sure, you know? Yeah. How did you convince your editors and everyone to do something that's a national story, not really with an Indiana focus? Was there a point where they kind of were like, yo, 
do some Indiana stuff or? <laughs> I've gotten away with so much, let me tell you. Um, unrelated story, but it's relevant. Uh, I was at the Star for three weeks when I got this tip about a uh, case up in Northwest Indiana of a woman who said sh she and her three children were possessed by demons and the child welfare agency, the uh, registered nurse and others affiliated with the case believed that what she was saying was true. And so imagine you've been in a uh, publication for three weeks and you stroll up to your investigative editor at the paper and you say, hey, so I want to do this story about demonic possession and exorcisms, and uh, is that OK? <laughs> so this was not the craziest thing they'd ever heard me say and ask to do. But I, I do think, um, joking aside, that the thing that was significant here is that USA Gymnastics is an Indiana-based nonprofit, national governing body. So there was a local connection for us. And I was also incredibly fortunate that I had bosses who were really passionate about investigative journalism and about work that matters. And there was never a moment when they weren't supportive of it. If you look at um, between personnel resources, the motion to intervene, that motion to intervene um, was fought to the Georgia Supreme Court twice. Um, we ultimately won the records nine months later. They were released to us, heavily redacted, of course. Um, and I, I mean, we're talking probably six figures of investment because they believed in the work that we were doing. So there was never a point there they were like, hey, do you think you could like work more? <laughs> they actually told us on several occasions to go home. <laughs> yeah. When you work in like an investigations team, um, especially for, like an uh, like a national reaching uh, organization, like how do you decide exactly like what tips to follow and like what constitutes the story that you would like pursue, especially if it was like a tip that seems kind of random, like in Georgia where you're, you're in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. but, like how do you sort of sort of craft an investigation from like something so small, to something so big? So, a couple different ways. Um, when I'm looking at investigations. Right. Uh, when you're doing reporting, you get more tips than you have time for. I mean, the, the biggest constraint that you have is generally your time. And so what I'm looking for personally when I was at the Indianapolis Star, I have a different focus now. I've, I'm on the national investigative team, so I have a different outlook. But when I was at the Indianapolis Star, um, my thought process was, is this have broader implications? Is this not just a, an individual case? If it was an individual case, does it signify something bigger that's going on within a system, whatever that might be, right? Is there a, a deep local connection here that should matter to the public that I'm serving? So I'm looking at things like that. And when I get an initial tip, I'm looking at, OK, what is the minimum story? What is the maximum story? So if only a slice of what they're saying is true, is there a minimum story that will come out of this? Is it worth my time? Is the maximum story important enough, significant enough, that it's worth the, worth the time to invest and see whether it's something bigger? And in doing that sort of weighing process specific to USA Gymnastics, I thought it was worth the time. There was also the time trigger because of that question of whether records would be sealed. And so that was why I put aside the other thing I was doing, not that it wasn't important, but that's why I pursued USA Gymnastics first. Does that make sense? Yeah decide when like it's time to move on to a new story because I'm sure like, this is supposed that to be is a great to question and, yeah like, when do you say like now it's time to do something that's not this? well there's a you know there's the there's the editor answer <laughs> and then there's the reporter answer right so I think um you know for USA Gymnastics I mean we worked on it full time for uh, I guess a year. And then there was sort of a little off time where we started working on other things, but then we got pulled back in because again, there was a lot of attention on USA Gymnastics. And so, um, you know, it was what the investigation required. And I would say, you know, there's sort of a tug of war with something like that when you're doing it, because on one hand, you broke it, you're passionate about it, you think it's really important, but then on the other hand, you're getting fatigued because you're not 
if you're an investigative reporter, you're not a beat reporter, right? So you're not supposed to generally be covering every kind of turn of the screw. And so that was always a real struggle that we had. And I wish I had a better answer for you. But the thing is that we just would talk about it. Like, is this important enough that we need to write it? And uh, full disclosure, I got uh, asked to help out on a USA Gymnastics story this week. So, and it's been, you know, more than three years now. So I don't think there's a good answer. I think it's kind of what the investigation requires, what your editors want. Um, but you're never deciding anything in a vacuum. Yeah. Did you ever have any conflict working with a team on who was going to do what, what leads to follow, and how did you deal with that? And how did you deal with keeping communication open with your team? Sure. I mean, conflict is inherently going to happen when you're working nonstop. Right? I mean, it's just, a, it's you get tired, nerves get frayed, right? It happens. Um, when dynamics like that happen, inevitably, you just have to remember, why are we doing this? What are we here for? And we're here for the public interest. We're here for the work and just trying to focus on that work. And that's all you can do. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the personal aspects of it. It's about the work. Yeah, one more. So who wants to be the lucky uh, closer? No pressure. Oh, wow. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Can you just tell um, everybody kind of how you went from being a student journalist to breaking into journalism? The, the resume you? journey? Sure. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, I had my first professional internship at 15 at a weekly newspaper in Michigan. Uh, advisor and source newspapers. And uh, then I was an apprentice at the Detroit Free Press after I, uh, the summer after I graduated from high school. Then I was the uh, managing editor of Grand Valley State University's college paper my first year of college, the editor in chief my second year. And then I was working full time at a small daily called the Grand Haven Tribune. Um, my last year of college, I graduated in three years, um, doing education reporting. So I did that. Then I became a thing back in the day that was called a convergence reporter. So I moved to South Carolina, and I was uh, a reporter who worked both for the newspaper and the TV station. This is back when they were owned by the same company. And so what I would do would be, if I was doing a story about... I don't know, a business, I would write the article about it. I would do a uh, BOSAT or whatever the case may be on it. And then I would also do online, because that was a different thing back then. Uh, so I did that. Then I was a government reporter for the Florence Morning News in South Carolina. Then I was a uh, government reporter at the Times of Northwest Indiana. Then I was promoted to criminal courts. It doesn't sound like a promotion, but I swear it was. Uh, and then they asked me, you know, I was doing investigative stories while doing beat reporting at the same time. And they said, hey, do you want to do investigations full time? So when I was at the Times of Northwest Indiana in 2009, I started doing investigations full time. And then I joined the Indianapolis Stars investigative team in 2013. And I was there until last month when I shifted kind of over to USA Today, I'll officially shift after I finish this last project. But that's sort of the semi-short version <laughs> of my experiences. But seriously, guys, you know, if there's anything you want to talk through, any questions you have, I'm really accessible. I'm easy to find. Bug me anytime. Thanks. <laughs>